The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 7521 in the name of Richard Baker on the safety of offshore oil and gas workers. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Richard Baker to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Baker. Thank you, President Officer. The, the tragic helicopter crash on the 23rd of August, two miles west of Sumbra, in which four people lost their lives, has brought the issue of offshore safety to the fore once more. On the 4th of September, this Parliament heard a statement from the Cabinet Secretary in which he spoke for all of us uh, when he expressed our deepest sympathy and condolences for the families, friends and colleagues who had lost loved ones that day. Following the statement, members across the chamber focused on the need to ensure all necessary action is taken so that the safety of the helicopter fleet can meet the highest standards for the future and to instill confidence among the workforce in the helicopter fleet which have been shattered in the aftermath of this tragedy. And can I thank uh, those members who signed my motion to allow this debate to take place today. Uh, this motion follows this most recent tragedy, but it also reflects on the sad and deeply concerning fact that this incident was the fifth in four years where a Super Puma helicopter had ditched. This raises so many questions of how we improve helicopter safety in the future, and members will, I'm sure, reflect on a number uh, of important and different aspects of how we should achieve this. But at the heart of this motion is an issue which is highlighted by events since the tragedy which took place in 2009, which all of us will remember too well, when 16 people lost their lives. Because today, four years after that crash, a fatal accident inquiry has still not taken place. I've tabled this motion as a result of the campaign which my own trade union, Unite, has taken forward on behalf of their members and offshore representatives of uh, Unite join us from Aberdeen today. They're calling on the Scottish Government to support the proposals which have been brought forward by my colleague Patricia Ferguson in her proposed inquiries into death's bill, a key aspect of which is to make the process of fatal accident inquiries quicker and more transparent. Speaking in the days after the fatal crash in August, Unite Scottish Secretary Pat Rafferty said, Friday's horrific event should now compel the Scottish Government to ensure the safe passage through Parliament of Patricia Ferguson's FAI reforms. On Thursday, we vented our anger over the current FAI process and the ridiculous delays in starting the FAI into the 2009 Super Puma crash, the agony this is causing victims' families, and the fact that we do not have legally enforceable outcomes from the process. This last comment from Pat Rafferty gets to the nub of the issue. Ensuring the FAI process is not so protracted in the future is vital for those who have lost loved ones and also for offshore workers today who need to have confidence that any lessons which need to be learned from previous accidents have been learned and action taken so that as a result they can be as safe as possible when travelling to their work offshore. All of us here want to have a helicopter fleet in the North Sea which has the best possible safety standards and in which offshore workers have confidence. But the fact that in addition to there having been this number of incidents in the past few years, uh, in addition to that, uh, we have had such a, an ongoing delay into the fatal accident inquiry into the 2009 crash has only undermined that confidence further. And it's not only Unite who have these concerns, as is evidenced by the briefing members have had from the RMT union ahead of this debate this afternoon. Last week in the Press and Journal, the Lord Advocate stated that he did not wish to see a delay to a fatal accident inquiry into the fatal crash in August, and this is a welcome statement. The question must be, though, how, without legislation, how will that uh, ambition be achieved? When I questioned the Cabinet Secretary on this issue after his statement, he pointed to the fact that the inquiries by the Air Accident Investigation Branch have taken two and a half years. And of course, this is an important aspect, and investigations can be very complex. But that does not in itself account for a delay of four years, or indeed for a year's delay from the decision last January by Crown Counsel that there would be no criminal charges into the 2009 crash, to the point where we expect the inquiry to be held next January. Presiding officer, there are a number of steps which require to be taken in light of these accidents. 
Of course, action within the, within, within the industry itself is vital, and I know these are issues which the Helicopter Safety Steering Group are working assiduously to address. The recent announcement of a review of seating arrangements in the aircraft is welcome, though some people will say it's not before time, as is a Civil Aviation Authority review in collaboration with its Norwegian counterpart. And that's welcome because, as Annette Milne pointed out after the ministerial statement, uh, after the tragedy, the record of safety in Norway is good and perhaps there are lessons that we can learn from there. But it remains important that there is now a full independent inquiry given the number of incidents in the same way that the Cullen inquiry took place after the Piper Alpha tragedy. I hope ministers therefore will support the call from my colleague Frank Doran MP for the UK government to instigate such a review. The presiding officer, the key thing for us in this parliament is to take what action we can to promote safety. And this parliament can act to ensure there are no longer unnecessarily protracted waits for fatal accidents inquiries, prolonging the suffering for families seeking answers and potentially delaying action which requires to be taken to improve safety for the future. I hope ministers and other members will give serious consideration to the campaign being taken forward by Unite and the bill being brought forward by Patricia Ferguson, because we believe this is a crucial issue if we are to put first that goal at which Unite and their members and workers have identified, to protect and serve the interests of the industry's most important resource, its people. Thank you. Many thanks. I have a number of members who would like to be called in this debate, so speeches of up to four minutes, please, and we will try to accommodate everyone. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I begin by apologising that I may not be able to remain till the end of the debate, as I have constituents visiting Parliament today, which was arranged well in advance of knowing that this member's debate would be taking place. I, I, I congratulate Richard Baker on securing the debate today, and I think where I want to focus my contribution is around the issue of helicopter safety in, in, initially. Um, but I, I do want to pass reference to the, the, the words he, he spoke in terms of the, the fatal accident and inquiry. Um, the heliport uh, and the helicopter operators are based within DICE in my constituency, and having grown up in DICE, uh, my familiarity with the movements of helicopters and indeed helicopter noise has been something that I've, I've grown up with and indeed developed uh, something of an immunity but, uh, to the noise that helicopters make. But what was interesting uh, and, and stark was the, the silence that pervaded when the grounding of helicopter flights took place and it was noticeable the lack of helicopter movements that were taking place around the community. Many of my constituents, many of my uh, family and friends are either directly or indirectly involved in the offshore industry and the flights that take place. And I've heard many tales of family members, uh, be they partners or children, um, obviously being deeply concerned for the safety of those who they love who are having to be transported by helicopter to the rigs. And having spoken to a number of individuals, they've said that, you know, obviously one has to look at the, the overall um, safety record of the helicopters, but at the same time it is nonetheless concerning the number of uh, incidents that have taken place over a fairly short period of time. Now, I mentioned during the uh, question to the Cabinet Secretary uh, following a statement that I attended school with one of the victims of the 2009 fatal accident. Uh, Stuart Wood was the year below me at Dice Academy and I noticed the comments from his mother in the press recently around the delays to the fatal accident inquiry taking place. And I think we would all wish to place on record our desire to see that fatal accident inquiry take place as soon as possible to ensure that uh, some of the uh, questions that the family of the victims have can be addressed. I think we need to look at this in the context of what is currently taking place around helicopter safety. The recent announcements this week, which I'm sure were not prompted by the fact that Richard Baker had a members debate in Parliament today, but nonetheless uh, have uh, 
perhaps taken, taken precedence in, in the last few days around the Civil Aviation Authority review, which I welcome the fact that the Norwegian uh, Civil Aviation Authority will be involved in that review, given the fact that we understand that the, the Norwegian safety record is somewhat better than that uh, of the UK safety record. I think that it is uh, very welcome that the head of helicopter safety of the Norwegian CAA is going to be working very closely with that review. The, the recent reports around looking at the seating configuration on Super Puma helicopters, which I know was an issue that, that was raised during meetings that I had with uh, and other MSPs had with Eurocopter, I think is something else that needs to be factored in. And I think the, the announcement uh, yesterday from, the, uh, from three of the operators that they are to launch their own review um, and are calling on other helicopter operators to become involved in that review, I think also uh, bears witness to the fact that there is a lot of work ongoing at the moment. And I think where I would perhaps not necessarily be 100% in agreement with Richard Baker is I think that one can get into the situation where the, the landscape of review and the landscape of inquiry becomes cluttered and there's a point at which one must say where do we step back and allow some of the work that is being done to take place so that the lessons from that work can then be applied to any future inquiry or future review that takes place rather than have things running in parallel and running the risk of some of those lessons perhaps being missed and that's where I perhaps would, would say that I'm not necessarily 100% in agreement with Mr Baker. Thank you very much and I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you very much, and uh, let me too congratulate Richard Baker for bringing this debate, and indeed congratulate Patricia Ferguson for preparing a bill to reform fatal accident inquiries. 25 years ago, after the Piper Alpha disaster, survivors and bereaved families demanded change in the culture and regulation of safety offshore. Trade unions like the TNG and OILC campaigned for workers to have the right to elect safety reps offshore, while MPs like Frank Doran called for the regulation of offshore safety to be separated from the functions of the Department of Energy. It is fitting, therefore, that offshore safety reps are in the gallery for our debate today, that unions like Unite and RMT are again campaigning for change, along with the Pilots' Union, BALPA, and that there is a growing demand for an independent public inquiry into helicopter transport in the North Sea. Now, that inquiry must be UK-wide because the issues affect the whole UK sector and because regulation of civil aviation is the responsibility of the UK Department for Transport. But Scottish ministers are responsible for inquiries into the causes of fatal accidents in Scottish waters, and this is an area in which they can act. I hope, as uh, Richard Baker has said, that we will see FAIs in the coming months, not just on the 2009 disaster, but on this year's fatal accident as well. A number of other inquiries have indeed been announced. The Transport Committee of the House of Commons, the Civil Aviation Authority, the helicopter operating companies have all said they will undertake require, uh, inquiries or reviews of one sort or another. And all of these are welcome. But they will not of themselves answer all of the questions which are being asked by families and by survivors and by those who work offshore. Workers in the UK sector know that Norway has a better recent record in helicopter safety, but they will want to know why that is. Is it because of the hours that pilots fly? Is it because of the maintenance regimes in place? Or is it because of the regulatory regimes uh, within which helicopter companies operate? As Richard Baker said, they will, and, and indeed Mark MacDonald, they welcome this week's announcement that Eurocopter will look at reconfiguring the seats on helicopters to improve safety. But they also ask whether there should be fewer seats or whether there should be emergency lighting at doors or windows to help people to escape in the dark. FAIs and an independent inquiry can help us understand those things and also answer other questions, whether helicopter operating companies should be empowered set, to set standards of equipment which is issued to their passengers by third parties, whether when the waves are so high that fast rescue craft cannot be launched, helicopters should be flying uh, at all, uh, or indeed whether safety reps offshore have enough time to carry out their duties in full and enough confidence to raise concerns before things go wrong. Following this public inquiry into Piper Alpha, Lord Cullen recommended many changes which were endorsed by all concerned and have made a real difference to the culture of safety offshore. The same Lord Cullen, many years later, recommended changes in the system of fatal accident inquiries. Those recommendations have not yet been implemented. Now, the North Sea today is a mature oil province. Much of the offshore infrastructure is nearing the end of its design life. Making profits from now on will demand much higher rates of investment. So the need for effective maintenance is increasing. 
just as the financial rewards become harder to obtain. That is why this is a good time for a comprehensive review of safety in the North Sea, starting with the journey to and from work. Early and effective fatal accident inquiries can help to set a new benchmark for the next 40 years, and I would urge ministers to help make that happen. Thank you. Many thanks. Call Maureen Watt to be followed by Alex Johnson, and I must keep members tight to the time. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I too thank Richard Baker for the offer opportunity uh, to record our again to record our horror at the su Super Puma crash. I'm sorry, would you be able to lift your microphone up, please? The tragic Many loss thanks. of life and how it highlights the risks that offshore workers take every day in uh, securing our oil and gas supplies and to express again our condolences to the families and also our thanks to all the rescue services involved. I'm always amazed at um, the, how people manage to escape from helicopter crashes. I have done the helicopter evacuation training several times and even in a swimming pool it's pretty scary. If you don't get it right, you end up as a human washing machine. Um, and although this time I think the helicopter landed without turning over, I welcome um, the industry looking at the reconfiguration of seating because I do think it's miraculous then when people manage to escape in a sea situation rather than in the swimming pool and amazed at how calmness and the, the training kicks in. I'm old enough to remember when the Chinooks uh, provided helicopter um, journeys to the North Sea installations. And I must admit, I was very glad when they were withdrawn because I found them particularly scary. But it should be remembered that helicopters are a vital method of transportation to the offshore rigs and platforms. Uh, because there are also great risks involved in ship transfer uh, to the installations. I hope all members here and others will come to the next cross-party oil and gas group, which um, will be discussing the helicopter accidents on the 8th of October in P102. I also welcome the number of inquiries, and I notice that one of them is the, all the helicopter operators coming together to review their operations and to share best practice. And I'm saddened that Balpa said that the investigations were too little, too late, and I do hope that they will fully um, engage in the um, investigations. Um, I'm glad that the CAA yesterday announced its investigations and that it will be done in conjunction with the Norwegian uh, Civil Aviation Authority, as others have mentioned, and the European Aviation Safety Agency, um, and that it will investigate um, all the Super Puma in, uh, accidents of the last four years, uh, operators' decision-making, internal management, protection, of passengers, crew and pilot training and performance, and helicopter uh, airworthiness, and I look forward to hearing um, the results of those. I think we should also mention uh, the Boots on Safety campaign too, where all the oil operators um, are engaging with all employees uh, on and offshore and reassuring them about safety, and that people who have real concerns about travelling offshore um, and don't want to will be handled um, with uh, sympathy and consideration, and I hope the trade unions will keep uh, a, an eye on that. I would hate anyone to lose their jobs just because um, the, of the particularly high anxiety that exists at the moment. Um, it is important to wait for the outcome inquiries rather than rushing to any uh, particular answer on these uh, uh, crashes, and I hope that will happen. Thank you very much. And I call Alec Johnson to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Can I begin, Deputy Presiding Officer, by thanking Richard Baker for having taken this opportunity to bring this issue back to the Chamber. Uh, we did, about a, less than a month ago, have the opportunity to uh, listen to a statement by the Minister and respond to that. But it is extremely important to keep this issue on the parliamentary agenda. 
The fact is that the journey to and from work is a frustration for many and an annoyance to some. But for those who make that journey to and from uh, installations in the North Sea, it is a, a significant uh, and imposing duty which we should never underestimate. The number of accidents which have happened in the North Sea have only served to make that frustration greater. It is important that we realise that one of our primary responsibilities is to ensure that the confidence of those who use helicopters in the North Sea uh, is increased wherever possible. And that's why it's so important that many of the things that are already happening uh, continue and deliver in the longer term. I would like to once again pay tribute to the work of the Helicopter Safety Steering Group and its role during the process uh, right at that initial phase when confidence was overnight undermined in the helicopters uh, but returned fairly quickly after discussion and uh, reports. It is important that there is an inclusive group and that the role of uh, bringing the industry together with trade unions and other interested parties within that grouping uh, is vital to the level of confidence that is delivered when an accident happens. Uh, I congratulate their work. Since then, of course, we have had the announcement that there will be a CAA review into the broader issues of helicopter safety in the North Sea. Uh, I think that's an important step forward uh, and one which I welcome. The fact that it will also take into account uh, what's happening in the Norwegian sector and perhaps give us the opportunity to draw comparisons between safety records and what is being done to achieve these safety records will be something that delivers long term. It must be said, however, that the key element of what has been brought forward today in this motion revolves around the issue of fatal accident inquiries and the fact that one has not yet been held in relation to that worst of the fatal accidents which happened in 2009 with the death of 16 people. It is an interesting uh, situation and one which I am not an expert in, but what I can say today is that this uh, motion today brings an extra dimension to the proposal which Patricia Ferguson has brought forward, and it is one that the Conservatives will give serious consideration to in this uh, changed context. So I look forward to the opportunity to speak to uh, Patricia Ferguson and others in this regard to ensure that we do take the opportunity to do the right thing. Solidarity is vital uh, in ensuring that the industry uh, is strong and able to stand up to these pressures. Solidarity will also be important within this chamber to ensure that we go forward uh, with a united uh, and well thought out direction which will allow us to deliver the improved safety standards and the improved confidence which are vital to the future of this industry. I undertake that I will do all I can to make sure that solidarity is cross-chamber. Many thanks. I now call Dennis Robertson to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I too would like to congratulate uh, Richard Baker for bringing this debate back to um, the Chamber. Uh, given the constraints of time, Presiding Officer, um, it's perhaps important maybe not to go over the same uh, ground that other members have already done with re in respect of the work of the CAA and the inquiries going on. Um, I cannot, for one moment, Presiding Officer, put myself in the place of those workers that travel um, uh, to and from an oil rig. Um, and today, I'm sure their confidence is, is somewhat uh, at a level that uh, we would wish it, it wasn't. Uh, Lewis MacDonald did mention Piper Alpha, and this is our 25th year, and, and, and I was at the memorial service at Hazelhead in Aberdeen, and I was speaking with families who had lost um, uh, loved ones <clears throat> during that absolute dreadful tragedy. And I remember myself uh, during Piper Alpha asking myself, what rig's my father-in-law? What rig was my stepfather on? Because I had no idea. And for that moment, that fleeting moment, you put yourself in a situation that you, you reflect and think, my goodness, I sincerely hope it's not one of my relatives. And the understanding that it's someone else's presiding officer. Each death, each incident, each accident within the North Sea brings us back to tragedies like Piper Alpha. 
The recent tragedies with the helicopter incidents and one of my own constituents was fortunate to be a survivor. Again, I cannot understand the trauma that he must have gone through during that period of escape from that helicopter. Maureen Watt has said that it's important to understand the feelings and the anxieties of those members who perhaps don't wish to go offshore for the time being until confidence is restored back in the industry. And I would hope that the industry, supported by the trade unions, will do everything they can to support those workers. And it's not just the workers presiding officer that are going out to the North Sea to keep the oil and gas flowing. It's the support staff that's there too, but it's their families at home. Again, they must be under a great deal of pressure and anxiety. And I would say that we must respect those people who have that anxiety because the industry is looking for profit. The industry needs to keep the oil and gas flowing. There is no doubt about that. But that should never be at the cost of the health and safety of the workers within that industry. Much has been done over the years to protect the workers and health and safety has improved immensely. And I sincerely hope it continues to do so to ensure that we have no more fatal tragedies within the North Sea. Thank you. Many thanks. Before I call Tavish Scott, can I advise the Chamber that due to the number of members who still wish to speak in the debate, I am to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes and ask Richard Baker to move. Absolutely. Many thanks. Uh, the question is that the debate be extended. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. I now call Tavish Scott to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Deputy Presiding Officer, thank you very much. Uh, I reflected uh, on Richard Baker's members' debate uh, when I flew out of Sumbra on Tuesday, not least of which because I paid more attention than I normally do to the safety briefing. And I absolutely take Maureen Watt's uh, uh, observations about the, uh, the helicopter um, emergency training that a number of us have been uh, through and how different that is to the reality of that uh, uh, <laughs> summer's morning in Sumbra, summer, summer's evening in Sumbra, when there wasn't actually that much swell uh, relative to a normal swell of the, off two miles off the headland at Sumbra Head uh, when the Super Puma went down on the 23rd uh, of August. And I just want to lay on record my um, gratitude to the professionalism of all who were involved in dealing with that accident, both on shore uh, and through the emergency services. And indeed, I'm at home at Sumbra tonight to meet some of the staff concerned and, and thank them personally for uh, what they did at that time. Uh, there, it strikes me that there are two points that Richard Baker has rightly brought to the Chamber, to Parliament's attention today, which need to be separated. The first is his absolutely understandable uh, ask that we look at the fatal accident inquiry system, uh, and that has to be uh, reformed. It is nothing short of outrageous that four years have gone by, uh, and people, loved ones, families still do not have a definitive account of what went wrong. The system is clearly not working, clearly is not working, and therefore measures that come forward from, uh, from any party uh, to address that, in my view, are, should be supported and should be actively uh, looked at. But the second issue that Richard Baker and Lewis MacDonald and other members have raised is the now four inquiries that are underway. Now, I'm not convinced that four inquiries should be underway. I think that makes Lewis MacDonald's point that should we not be having one definitive uh, public inquiry led by uh, an appropriate uh, judge or an appropriate figure uh, rather than four separate inquiries because what in, uh, arguably that does is to put uh, not only the trade unions not only the workforce who are desperate for the confidence and the certainty of knowledge as to what happened but also everyone else who is a deep uh, and long-term commitment to this industry in a degree of doubt as to when all these will report, how they will interact with each other and what do they actually uh, mean. And I, I would urge the industry uh, and governments, both London and Edinburgh, to think quickly about whether it's desirable to have four separate inquiries going on instead of pulling those all into one, which is, I think, what should uh, happen. Uh, I'm not convinced that... Um, that the CEA inquiry is all that uh, others uh, believe it to be. After all, the CEA has a central role in investigation and a central role in regulation. So I'm not quite sure how the CEA can also investigate incidents that have happened, uh, but most recently off summer on the 23rd of August, but also um, did happen in the past. I absolutely take the point that Maureen Watt and others made with regard to the Norwegians and the Norwegian expertise. That's an entirely relevant point. But surely that should be addressed by a 
independent public inquiry rather than by one of the bodies, the CEA, who should be giving evidence to an independent public inquiry, not who should be the master of the terms of reference uh, for a further work. I don't doubt their commitment. I don't doubt their expertise. I don't doubt their ability to bring uh, very strong recommendations to the table. But they are part of the system, and therefore I don't see quite how they, how they undertake that work. Similarly, with the oil industry's own uh, work, uh, clearly, I, I will not be the only member who's talked to Malcolm Webb and to others in the industry about what, um, has, what they plan in terms of the uh, helicopter safety steering group and the other uh, reviews. But it does strike me again that, that the confidence that the industry needs, the confidence that the workforce needs for the future is best rebuilt uh, by that independent inquiry uh, so that those such as the industry can address that. And I think the pilots union uh, said a lot of pretty relevant things about a number of these inquiries when they expressed their concern uh, over the nature of the current um, of the CA inquiry, that needs, to be, that needs to be uh, dealt with, and I hope in terms of confidence we'll end up with one inquiry and it'll be publicly led. Many thanks. Kevin Stewart to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too thank uh, Richard Baker for bringing this again to the Chamber today. Um, I've stated before, as have many others, uh, of my own links of friends and family who work offshore. Um, and for many folk, if you're away from Aberdeen, um, people are a bit surprised if you hear news of an accident that your immediate reaction is to head for the nearest phone uh, to ensure uh, that your loved ones are safe. And as Dennis Robertson says, um, it is no consolation to think that there may be somebody else uh, who has lost loved ones uh, because of tragic accidents. And I think that no matter what uh, conclusion we may come to at the end of this debate, uh, every single member here has played a large role in ensuring that health and safety uh, in the North Sea is best as it can be, particularly through, through the cross-party group uh, on oil and gas, who have looked very carefully uh, at this, these issues in my time here, uh, where we've heard from step change, union reps and the industry uh, about how improvements could be made. We have heard today a little bit about all of the inquiries that are underway. Um, the CAA investigation with support from the <coughs> European Aviation Safety Agency with input from Norwegian partners. Uh, we have heard about the air accident investigation branch. We have heard of the uh, operator's review. Uh, and we have an appeal today um, that the FAI uh, process should be speeded up. And in the last speech, uh, we heard um, Tavis Scott call for a public inquiry, which of course uh, is not in the jurisdiction of this parliament or of this government. Um, and I do have um, a concern about a clutter of inquiries, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, there are only so many experts who can look at what the failings may actually have been. But is a quick fatal accident inquiry the answer? And I've been looking at this situation and have looked at uh, what is said about FO FAIs. Uh, and the documentation from government and from the court say the purpose of an FAI is to determine where and when the death took place, the cause of the death, reasonable precautions whereby the death might have been avoided, the defects, if any, in any system of working which contributed to the death or any accident resulting in the death, and any other relevant facts relevant to the circumstances of the death. And I think in some regards, you know, a fatal accident inquiry would be in the dark round about some of these things, because we have not concluded as yet what failings have been. I've also, um, presiding officer, had a, a good look at the Cullen report, um, which was produced in 2009 about fatal accident inquiry legislation. Um, and I have to say that I have not gone through the entire document, because it is rather large, but I think you know there are some interesting points there. From my perspective, um, presiding officer, um, and this is where I agree uh, with Alec Johnson, 
I think we need to see the improved safety standards uh, without a doubt. But in the words of, uh, uh, of Lewis MacDonald, where he called for early and effective FAIs, I don't think that an early FAI may necessarily be an effective I'm one. Afraid you must and I think you know, this is something that I intend to dwell on uh, as we go forward. Many thanks. Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Christian Allard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I add my condolences to those expressed by colleagues to the families who lost a loved one on the 23rd of August and recognise, too, the work of the rescue services. And may I also congratulate my colleague Richard Baker for securing this important debate. Richard's interest in the conditions faced by workers in the North Sea is extensive and it's fitting that he leads this debate today. The motion, of course, makes reference to the draft member's bill I have issued for consultation. And I would like to outline today why I believe such a bill to be necessary and how it is relevant to this tragedy. Speaking to people who have lost a loved one in a workplace or other incident, three things have become clear to me. The first is that the time it takes to hold a fatal accident inquiry is often far, far too long. Secondly, those families do not feel that they have the level of involvement in the process of making that decision as to whether or not a fatal accident inquiry is held. They don't have the level of involvement that they would like to have. And thirdly, that when an FAI takes place, the sheriff conducting it cannot make binding recommendations and the lessons that could be learned from the inquiry are not always applied. Unfortunately, this case demonstrates those points only too well. Because, as the motion says, this is not the first time a Super Puma helicopter has crashed into the sea, and the families of the 16 people who died in 2009 are still waiting to hear if there will be an FAI. So could lessons have been learned from the crash in 2009? Well, I don't know. None of us can know. But what I do know is that in 1989, a fatal train crash took place at Belgrove in Glasgow. Two trains collided at a point where two tracks converged into one. The cause of the accident was found to be that the driver of one of the trains did not react to a signal warning him of that line convergence. Now, this is a recognised phenomenon in the railway industry. It's known as SPAD, signal passed at danger. The sheriff in that case recommended a simple change to the system, a double signal in effect, on the basis that a driver was less likely to miss two danger signals. Those recommendations were not implemented. And in 1991, the Newton Rail disaster occurred, where four people died and 21 were injured. The principal cause of this tragedy, a signal passed at danger. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has said that it will legislate in this issue. In fact, it has said so on several occasions. But unfortunately, the legislative programme so far has been silent on the issue. And that is why I am going ahead with my proposal. And I would say to the Minister, please consider this bill. Take this bill, if you will. You won't necessarily agree with everything in it. But let's have the debate. Let's hear from the families and let's hear from the trade unions and let's hear too from the industry and what they have to say because they understand that delays are detrimental to them too. They have to have the liability for an incident on their books until such times as the cause has been established. They know too the cost both in terms of personal involvement and in terms of money of people having to come back to go through again an incident that was a tragedy at the time and which years later is still a tragedy. Now, I realise that ministers have many other priorities and I would just say to the minister today that I, I'm not just consulting on this as an idea. The bill is already drafted and I would happily work with the minister and the cabinet secretary and with other parties, and I welcome Mr Johnson's comments particularly, because at the end of the day, this isn't about party politics, it's about people's lives. I'm afraid you must conclude. Presiding officer, no one should lose their life just because they go to work. We here have the power to make a difference. Let's use it. Thank you. And I'm afraid I can only give a shorter contribution to Christian Allard. Presiding officer, I will add my thanks to Richard Baker for 
bringing the debate to the Chamber. I too would like uh, to extend uh, really my condolences to the families. Last week, I heard firsthand from the industry how the relatives of the victims felt after the helicopter disaster in August. I was told that some of those relatives would like to help to make commuting offshore safer. I commend the industry and the unions for the way they have engaged with the partners and families of the victims. Earlier this month, we all listened to the heartfelt statement of Cabinet Secretary John Sweeney. I remember the emotion we felt in the chamber as members spoke thereafter. You might recall, presenting officer, that I made then the call for relatives of offshore workers to be represented at the senior level on the work of the Helicopter Safety Steering Group, HSSG. The proposal is for the industry to give partners and relatives a voice in the way forward for the industry. We can all imagine the world experienced by families and relatives as they wait for news at home and for their loved ones to return safely from their shift offshore. Parents worry too when their children decide to join the industry. Partners finding it very difficult to cope with their anxiety when waiting for their loved one to return and to explain to children what could happen. Uh, I recall too, like Dennis Robertson, uh, the Aberdeen's memorial, uh, the ceremony in Aberdeen's memorial garden in July, when we remembered the 167 men who lost their lives in the North Sea 25 years ago. Still, the memory, the memory of the commemoration in my mind, I went to an early helicopter safety steering group town hall event a few weeks later. The industry, uh, the unions, and the workforce were talking about safety procedures to return the EC25 fleet to service. Partners and relatives were listening to every word. Pilots and offshore workers were asking the questions. At the end of the morning, uh, someone left the room in tears. With others agreed, when others uh, agreed with the decision to let the EC25 to fly again, it didn't feel right. Like Patricia Ferguson, I feel we should uh, do. Uh, leave some space for partners and relatives to take an active part in any review taking place. I understand that the industry is not set up to include partners and relatives. How can we take part in the discussions around helicopter safety at the senior level, I ask. I understand that it might be a challenge for the families to organize themselves to be able to participate. But I feel we should do something about it, whatever review uh, we think we should take forward. President officer, partners and relatives should be at the main table because they are relevant stakeholders. They too have a contribution to make. To have their voice heard remains a challenge for the industry, for the workforce and for us all. Many thanks. And I call on Fergus Schoen to respond to the debate. Minister, you have up to seven minutes. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I would like to thank uh, Richard Baker for bringing this, this important debate to Parliament today and to thank all the members who have spoken across all parties in this matter for the contributions to this debate, which has been sombre, serious, considered, and uh, I think uh, 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 a useful contribution to the debate in what is plainly a matter of huge importance. I'd also like to take my opportunity to express my sympathies and condolences to the families, friends, and colleagues of all of those who lost their lives in this tragic incident. Uh, they were Sarah Darnley, Duncan Monroe, Gary McCrossan, and George Allison. Uh, and we must always uh, remember uh, these were the people who lost their lives, and the bereaved uh, who survived them will always remember them. Uh, I think uh, Dennis Robertson set out uh, that side of the matter very uh, powerfully. The Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney, made a statement to Parliament on Wednesday, 4th of September, where he outlined the facts of the incident, the tremendous response by the emergency services that resulted in the rescue of 14 survivors, and the strong leadership provided by the Helicopter Safety Steering Group in taking some difficult and challenging decisions to ensure the safety and, indeed, the confidence of the workforce. So I would uh, like to add my thanks to all of those who were involved in what was a tremendous effort, as Tavi Scott has alluded to as the member for uh, uh, the Shetlands, including Sumbara. Uh, so we, we all thank them. Uh, and uh, I had some experience of this when, as a member of the Lowman Mountain Rescue Team, I attended the call-outs on the 1st of February 1987, 
a fatality involving a helicopter crash. Uh, and uh, I note that the late Sergeant Harry Laurie is still remembered uh, from that day, although that was a Wessex helicopter sighting officer. These are very sombre occasions, and all of those who attend uh, will have that experience uh, etched in their memory. It's understandable that uh, huge concerns uh, exist, and these have been heightened, as members have said, because of the proximity in time of the helicopter incidents in the North Sea. This is the fifth incident since 2009 and the second involving fatalities. We know that these five incidents involved two specific types of aircraft, the L2 and the EC-225. The EC-225 has been subjected to stringent tests and analyses since it was grounded following the incident in October uh, at this point, I understand that the view uh, of uh, the Helicopter Safety Steering Group regarding regard, that they regard this EC-225 as the safest helicopter available for offshore operations anywhere in the world. That is their view. I think we have to pay credence to that, given their expertise. Clearly, the Helicopter Safety Steering Group will need to work hard in the coming weeks and months in order to get the message across to the workforce and to help rebuild the confidence of the offshore community, as many members in this debate have referred. In this regard, I understand that the steering group, in addition to releasing the suspension on the L1 and EC-225s, have also launched a far-reaching communications campaign across the industry to engage with the workforce in an effort to rebuild confidence. So we welcome those efforts. In terms of the investigation, on the 5th of September, the AAIB issued a special bulletin advising on the initial findings in which they stated that, to date, they have uncovered no evidence of, and I quote, a causal technical failure, end quote, in the helicopter. The special bulletin confirmed the earlier report that the preliminary investigation had found that the helicopter was intact when it struck the sea, as I think, uh, Maureen Watt uh, referred to uh, as being in an upright position. In addition, analysis of the data recorders found that both engines were delivering power until impact. On Tuesday, the CAA, the UK's specialist aviation regulator, announced a review of offshore helicopter operations in the North Sea. I, I think it is relevant to point out that their work is a review, not an inquiry. The CAA does not itself investigate uh, accidents. The Air Accidents Investigation Branch investigates incidents and following their investigation, the CAA as the regulatory body would take action if necessary. In that respect, I have got and I have read the remit, presiding officer, of the offshore helicopter operation in terms of reference and the objective and scope and the timescale and the membership and the remit, I think, although I'd be interested for Mr. McDonald's views because I think he raised some serious issues about would specific practical matters such as maintenance, such as the regulatory regime, the maintenance re uh, regime and the, rigorous, the rigorousness of it in respect to helicopters. And he mentioned various other factors. Now, uh, I think in relation to the review with the CAA, uh, there are um, a number of issues which they are looking at, but I'd be interested to know if Mr. McDonald considers that they, they are all covered and perhaps that's something we can come back to. Uh, I welcome as does uh, uh, Mark McDonald, I think, the fact that the review will be undertaken jointly with the Norwegian CAA and the European Aviation Safety Agency and advised by a panel of independent experts. It will study current operations, previous incidents and accidents. In other words, it won't just look at the most recent tragedy. Yes, I'll give way to Mr Baker. Richard Baker. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, for, for giving way. Um, I agree very much with what he said, but in terms of the issue of fatal accident inquiries, would this be an issue which the Minister would be willing to engage my colleague Patricia Ferguson on, as this is a central issue within the motion? Minister? Well, I, well, I was planning just to come on to that, so I'll deal with that just a minute. But just to finish off in relation to the remarks uh, about the CAA's uh, review, um, the point I was seeking to make really is that from my reading of the terms of the review, the background, the objective and scope, the time scale, I think this is a fairly substantial review uh, and I think that we have to and we should acknowledge that the people involved are involve a, a number of experts and people with huge experience in the industry. Of course, 
if members have any particular suggestions to make about the review and how it could be improved or extended or altered, then I would be very keen to receive them uh, perhaps after this debate. That's seven uh, minutes, Minister. Um, yes, turning to the, uh, the issue of a fatal accident inquiry. Now, plainly, I should say, Presiding Officer, this is one of these debates where I'm responsible for some matters and the Justice Secretary is responsible for taking forward the, uh, the, the serious issues that have been raised about the fatal accident inquiries, the timescale. Um, plainly, these are matters quite properly for the, for the Crown, for the Lord Advocate, and not for government. The, the Crown acts independently of government, and rightly so, and that plainly is an important principle. Uh, but in relation to the four-year time lapse between the 209 incident and the FEI, which I think was the point Mr Baker raised in his motion uh, this afternoon, and Patricia Ferguson also raised, the Cabinet Secretary has made available the timeline of the complex investigation to Parliament, and the Lord Advocate will publish that on the Crown Office website. Uh, uh, it's essential that complex investigations uh, are pursued uh, in a methodical way and are not rushed, but are comprehensive in detail. There have been over 600 witness statements taken and 2,000 documents gathered. In relation to Patricia Ferguson's bill, I understand that the consultation finishes on the 22nd of November and the Scottish Government will consider the final proposals when they are available. And Mr McCaskill has already given an undertaking to the Justice Committee that the bill to implement the Cullen recommendations will be brought forward within the lifetime of this Parliament. Uh, I will pass the official record of this debate to Mr McCaskill because I'm conscious that in the time available I have not been able to answer all of the questions raised. I would like to do that. Uh, I'm very keen to continue to ensure that the Scottish Government are fully engaged with the oil and gas industry and the trade unions. I'm meeting with a, a, a number of trade unions, senior trade union representatives, uh, tomorrow, as it happens, something that was arranged some time ago, and we will consider these matters very carefully. In conclusion, presiding officer, rebuilding the confidence of the men and women who travel to and from our offshore installations on a daily basis must be a key priority for us all going forward. Thank you. Before I conclude the debate, can I apologise to Christian Allard for cutting his time? I was advised that the Minister has another pressing engagement and had to leave the Chamber at 20 past. That concludes Richard Baker's Members' Business on Safety of Offshore Oil and Gas Workers, and I now suspend this meeting until 2.30pm. <laughs>